Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're interested in my first attempt to use Scott Satterley's 10-shot load development technique with the 140 grain Nosler RDF and Hodgkin Hybrid H100V, stick around. Guys, welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here and you want to see how I and the rest of the community here make our group smaller, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. That way you get notified when I post new videos so you won't miss anything. In this video, we're going to discuss my first attempt at Scott Satterley's method of load development. Now, I'm not here to tell you that it's right, wrong, or otherwise. I have watched the video 10 times like everybody else, and I'm going to give it a whirl. If you haven't seen it, this one probably won't make a whole lot of sense, so I'm going to include the link in the description box below. But today's video is very loosely based on the experiment that was run in that video. I thought this would be some very interesting testing to run, and since we're about to start load development on the 338 Lapua, Finding a technique to find a good load with as little testing as possible is our goal for obvious reasons. Obviously, cost savings. I've got some interesting feedback from some of my viewers as well about some of the methods that I was using, and so I figured I would give this one a try. Sitting here and arguing whether or not Scott Satterley is right is not a topic that I plan to discuss during these videos. I'm certain he has more experience than I, and his ability to perform at the PRS matches should speak for itself. He knows how to develop a load. We might just not be as effective as he is at it, but we might as well give it a whirl. How well it seems to work is a topic of argument on several forums that I have seen, so I thought I would set a lofty goal of trying to get this to work for myself. Don't worry guys, just subscribe, and if we don't find our load this time, we're going to keep trying at least for a little while to see if we can dial in a load or at least our reloading process. Our test rifle today is my Ruger Precision Rifle in 6.5 Creedmoor. This rifle is pretty much as it came from the factory, except for the aftermarket PRS Magpul stock. Today we're going to be using the Nosler RDF, which hasn't been my best performer if you guys are a fan of the channel, but maybe that's all about to change. As you can see, our powder for today is going to be Hodgkin's Hybrid H100V. Now obviously for this strategy to work, consistency in our reloading process is paramount. If we have inconsistencies in our process, the data will not mean anything to us. In their video, he is finding very large pressure nodes, relatively the same velocities over six tenths of a grain and ending up with a load that had an extreme spread of the velocity of not much over 5 feet per second. On your screen you will see an Excel graph that I created from the data that they show in the video. As you can see there's obviously two nice flat spots in the graph, one centered around 50.4 grains and the other around 51.5 grains. Those are charges that they determine that they want to test and end up one with an extreme spread of 1 and one with an extreme spread of 5 feet per second. So in today's video we're basically going to try to find something similar to that. This is certainly a lofty goal, and we certainly might not hit an extreme spread of 5 feet per second. Low a guy can dream, can he? We're going to look and see if we can find any of these nodes in our data to start looking for a good load for this combination. To start out, guys, I kind of took this to the extreme, kind of like I always do. And instead of loading every 0.2 grains, we actually started loading a tenth of a grain all the way up from 38.6 all the way to 41 grains. By the way, 41 grains is Sierra's max published load for hybrid H1V for their 140 grain projectile. Until I get the same confidence level in this method of load development, I'm just going to have to overdo everything. It's just the way I am. Please keep in mind as well that our goal along the way is to do as little additional case prep as possible. That's kind of what we're looking for. We don't want to be performing additional steps in our reloading process that we don't intend to do with all of our loads if we can absolutely prevent it. A couple golden rules of starting points, we are strictly using the same head stamp brass. In an upcoming video it will be more obvious why, but let's just take for granted that different brass manufacturers have different case capacities. At least for this load development, we need to have as few variables as possible. And for reference guys, from top to bottom, the lowest case volume that I have found in 6.5 Creedmoor is so far the PUA cases with a water capacity of about 52.4 grains. Low as a side note, I've heard alpha munitions is slightly lower. I haven't used any of it, so I can't tell you for sure. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Hornady, and those cases comparatively have a much larger case volume of 53.8 grains of water. And to some extent, guys, I'm sure this will affect the outcome of this test. In this particular case, we're using the same lot. Maybe it's important, maybe it's not, but at this stage of the game, we really don't know. Another rule, guy, obviously measuring our powder charge as accurately as possible is paramount. So for this task, I'm going to use this scale. This particular scale reports its measurement in 0.02 crane increments, and I feel pretty comfortable that it's giving me a far less than tenth of grain resolution. But again, that's another discussion for another video. In short, I can easily see adding and subtracting a single kernel of extruded powder, and I will be going to that level of precision for this load development. So guys, let's get into it, right? We're going to be using the Nosler RDF, part number 49824. We're using CCI 250 Large Rifle Magnum Primers. 
Like I mentioned, the powder we're using is Hodgkin's Hybrid 100V. The brass we're using is brand new SIG 6.5 Creedmoor brass. We full length sized it. We set the neck tension at one thousandths with our Sinclair Precision Mandrels. The cartridge overall length that we loaded to was 2.855 inches. And today's testing was actually performed at a density altitude of 917 feet. So guys, that out of the way, this is kind of what we ended up with. Not really a pretty target. But keep in mind guys, we're not really shooting for groups in this case. If you've seen their video, you know the actual point of impact is not important at this point. You're actually looking at the velocities attained at the specific charge weights. I'm sure you guys are a little bit interested, so I at least put the measurement on there. What ended up being 24 rounds was actually just over two MOA. Obviously, if you delete a couple of those shots, that group gets much smaller. But obviously, guys, a two MOA load is not what we're looking for. But the real story behind today's video is the velocity graph. And here, this velocity graph. Was it exactly what we were expecting? Probably not. Now, ordinarily, if you've seen their video, I would have shot a group at one of the velocities or two of the velocities on this graph just to see if the chart was lying to us. But after seeing this chart, I really wasn't sure where to go. Certainly some of the flat spots in velocity that are somewhere around 25, 60 feet per second is not what we're looking for. Sorry, guys, it's just not a competitive velocity for this weight of projectile. This velocity graph sure didn't look as pretty as Scott Satterley's graph. However, let's just see if we can learn something from it anyway. Now we're going a little bit crazy here, guys. As much as I would just like to pick that, you know, that 40.941 max load, seeing as they were a whole one foot per second away from each other, I'm just not sure that's how we should interpret this graph. So let's start talking about what we need to do. First of all, if you notice that there's no velocity listed for the 38.6 grain load. And guys, actually, this is because that round was a misfire. Yes, this is my first reload out of a multiple thousand rounds that I've reloaded. And this one is the first one that didn't go off. But in this case, I think it's a good thing. I mean, honestly, we really didn't want to find out anything at that charge anyway, right? The velocity is just too low. So guys, let's just start identifying things that we did wrong, or at least things that we could do better. Number one, this brass had never been fired before this test. Honestly, probably a little bit of a rookie mistake. But would you have guessed that the case volume in this unfired SIG case would have been just under 52 grains of water. And the average volume of all of our fired cases are actually 53.25 grains of water. So guys, I'll put the stats of the 25 untrimmed cases up there so you guys can see. Personally, I think this is one of our biggest problems. I really don't know how this graph would have looked had we actually had fire formed brass to start with. But maybe not there. Let's look at some other possibilities. Number two, since this is actually unfired brass, these had not been trimmed for length. Having a length variation probably had some effect on our neck tension, so next time we fire these, we'll certainly get rid of that. Maybe we should have done something different. Should we have sorted the brass by weight? Maybe that's important, maybe it's not. I weighed all these cases with 91% alcohol and converted this to water since that's what the language of the reloading community seems to speak and it's here in this chart. And as you can see, it really doesn't seem to matter much. Cases that had significantly different weights had still almost nearly identical case volumes, but trying to get as much info as we could at this point, did it make sense to graph the actual water weight case volume on top of the velocity and see if the case volume possibly affected some of our data? If you take a look at it, it's possible that some of this might have had an effect on the case. But like I mentioned, since it wasn't once fired, I am not sure of the effect of the brass expanding as the load was shot, how it would end up affecting the velocity of the load. I am going to file that under how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop, guys? I think the world may never know. Another thing that could have possibly affected it is it was barrel heat. Though certainly it was not hot at any time during this test, I did shoot two fouling rounds prior to actually starting the velocity test. But as you will notice, the velocity tended to drop as the barrel warmed up and then it climbed again. I will tell you guys, I know that my cold bore velocity is always higher than the second shot. In fact, my second fouling shot in this particular day was actually 32 feet per second slower than the first. So maybe two shots wasn't enough before we started this test. So like I said, guys, this is my first try. It's bound to get better from here, right? And may, honestly, guys, maybe this graph is a little bit more useful than we think. If we actually look at the velocity in the charts between 40.3 and 40.6, you can actually see that the extreme spread of all of those numbers is only 22 feet per second. Though the extreme spread is certainly larger than the extreme spread found by the 6.5 guys, maybe there is a load there to explore. And so I haven't really shown you guys yet, let's take a picture of the brass. And if you guys look, you'll actually see all the way from top to bottom, there's really no significant pressure signs. So maybe the next time we test this, we should go a couple tenths above the 41 grains to see if maybe that 41 grains truly is a flat spot. 
Like I mentioned when I started guys, I'm certainly going to give this another try. Now that we have some fired brass, we'll be able to trim it. And honestly, since we have the case capacity measured, we can even sort it by that. It certainly adds complexity to the test if we try and repeat it. However, does it make sense to do it? I'm really looking for some community feedback here. Would you take one of these loads based on the graph and try it? Do we need to repeat this exactly how we ran it with the fire formed brass? I would be very interested to know if you guys had actually tried something like this before and what the results that you got were. Did the results you find work well? Did you have trouble finding one at all? I really do think that there is merit to this method and I would love to see what we can do with it here. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and especially are you guys interested in more videos like this and if we get this style of load development working should we switch the load development style that we do on this channel to this type of method? Would this be more efficient? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you have any comments or questions on the video please put those in the comments section below. If you're not subscribed to the channel and you like the content please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the like button and until next week guys stay safe in small groups.